This book is fucking gorgeous. It's actually not my first omnibus, I own both the Kanan and Vader omnibuses, but the former only has 12 issues, so it's not a real omnibus, and the latter has about 29 issues, but it's Star Wars, so in my head I just don't see either of them as a proper Marvel omnibus. So I wanted my first real Marvel omnibus based on Marvel characters to be something special because let's face it, you never forget your first time. And for me, it had to be one of two things. This or the new Amazing Spider-Man by JMS omnibus that's just been released. Since this one is out of print and usually goes for around £150, I went for this since I managed to get it for £70 including delivery. I'm going to keep this as more of an overview and review of the actual omnibus itself rather than go into too much detail about the story because reviewing this many issues at once is too much for a digestible video I think and I have lots of the Ultimate Trades and Ultimate Collections so I'll definitely review Ultimate Spider-Man at some point and hopefully the entire Ultimate Universe as well but for this video I'm just going to keep it about the omnibus specifically. The first thing I'll say about it is that it's heavy. I expected it to be, but when the reality of you actually holding it in your hands hits you, you realise you just can't visualise how heavy one of these omnibuses is without actually having held one before. But it feels satisfying, like you've bought a decent sized tome that you're going to keep forever. From what I've seen, there are actually two versions of this available. The one that I have has the standard cover, and the alternative has variant art by Mark Bagley, who of course drew all the art in this book, as well as most of the art for Peter Parker's run in the Ultimate Universe. As much as I love Bagley's style in Ultimate Spider-Man, this is the cover I wanted. I wanted the one with Peter climbing the wall, in fact, I actually have a poster of this image and it does my head in because at the bottom they've stuck the Amazing Spider-Man logo on it and I just can't help noticing it every time I look at it. So this is the cover I wanted and it was drawn by Joe Casada and used as a variant cover for issue number one nearly 20 years ago. The spine is pretty standard for a Marvel Omni and I really hope that one day we'll get a second volume of this so the volume 1 written at the bottom isn't redundant forever. The back cover has the kind of style I like on Omnis, something both the Vader and Kanan Omnibus didn't have and that's the layout of all the covers in the book. There's just something about having this featured on the back cover that really makes it feel like it's important like, you look at it and go, oh my god, that's about four years worth of comics. At the bottom, it tells you exactly what you're getting, which in this case is Ultimate Spider-Man 1-39, to plus the half issue they released. Why is it a half issue instead of an issue zero? I have no idea, but I remember Ultimate X-Men had a half size issue too. When you take the dust jacket off, the boards are absolutely gorgeous and while I can't stand hardcovers without dust jackets normally this may be the first book I've ever owned where I think the book looks better without it. I don't know if the colour is showing up right on camera but I'll see if I can get it right in the editing but the red isn't the bright orangey red that we see in Ultimate Spider-Man. In fact when I first saw it it struck me how much it looks like Daredevil's costume in the Ben Affleck movie which, by the way, I still maintain is an awesome movie and remains faithful to the comic in spite of the fact that 90% of the planet seems to hate it. The red is offset with this absolutely beautiful silver embossed Ultimate Spidey logo and I think it looks amazing. I've never been a fan of gold, I've always thought silver went with other colours much better because it's actually a neutral colour unlike gold. So having this silver trim set against the red is absolutely jaw-droppingly beautiful. 
The spine has the same treatment with everything being in the same place as on the dust jacket except there's no silver embossed Peter here so they could afford to slightly lower the credits a bit but the overall effect is just as pretty as on the front board with the Marvel Omni logo, the Ultimate Spidey logo, the credits and volume 1 all embossed in silver against the red and it's so sexy. If Mary Jane was a book this is the book she'd be. The backboards don't really have anything at all, it's just the red. I wasn't really expecting anything there, but maybe they could have done something like some spider webs in the silver or written the famous with great power quote on the middle or something, but that's just me pulling shoulda woulda couldas out my ass. there's actually nothing wrong with it the way it is. So yeah, even without the dust jacket, it's still one of the best looking books I've ever seen. If the cover seems super shiny, it's because I cover all my books in Brodart and the more expensive ones get priority for obvious reasons and there's nothing worse than getting an out of print book with a dust cover then damaging it so they all get the Brodart treatment. The book wastes almost no time getting to the good stuff. The sides of the dust jacket have the blurb and information about the creators, there's two title pages and a credit page, and then they just get straight into Ultimate Spidey. Since issue 1 was the birth of the Ultimate Universe, there was no need to have a previously section at the front, but I'm curious to know if other Omnis have them. I think they could be useful sometimes, and just a page or two could really help someone out if they're reading their first Omni and it's set right after a major event, but like I said it wasn't needed here. So one of the things I loved about this book is the size. I know all the Omnis have the same dimensions, but it's something I really wanted because over here in England, when Ultimate Spider-Man was released, we actually got ours in oversized format for some reason. I have no idea why, especially considering our comics are normally printed the same size as the American ones, but they're usually a bit thicker because we get three issues in one and they have a cardboard cover rather than paper. But height and width wise, the Ultimate comics were basically A4 and the art looked amazing because of it and that's one of the reasons I wanted the Omnibus. Reading the trades or the Ultimate collections, which is basically just two trades in one, it's fine for getting the story and the art is still good, but having these oversized pages just took me back to being a teenager and reading the comics each month. Here's the size of a standard UK comic. I've had American comics before, so I can tell you it's the same size height and width wise. It also fits in the bags with the board quite nicely, so it's definitely the same size. Then for some reason, this is the size of the Ultimate comics we got in England. I have no idea why we got them that big, but I loved it. And this is both of them compared to the Omni. Now here's the Ultimate Collections, which are the same size as the Trades, and you can see you lose a lot of that size. So for me, to get the same kind of experience I used to get when reading this comic as a teenager, I had to have the Omnibus. Like I said, I'll still use the Ultimate Collections to review the story, unless I get the hardcovers but for reading the next 39 and a half issues, for me, it's had to be this. Each issue starts with its own cover page, and as far as I'm concerned, that should be a legal requirement when publishing comic collections. There's no excuse not to do it. It gives the reader the experience of reading an actual comic, and it helps people to know when they've read a full issue, and I like to read one or two at a time and walk away, so I love that they've included them here. One thing I did notice was that the cover for number 2 was different from the one we had in England, but the rest are the same. Issue 2's cover is actually the alternate cover for the Omni that I didn't want, but in England our issue 2 was the one that's in the back of this book, the issue 2 variant which was also by Joe Casada. The art on the pages looks amazing and the pages themselves don't seem to be that glossy. It could be because I got mine used but when I look at the Ultimate Collections, they definitely have a bit more of a sheen to the pages. Now, I'll talk about this more when I do the actual reviews, but Peter's creation story takes place over about six issues. Some people liked that, some hated it. Personally, I thought it worked because when Uncle Ben dies, 
rather than just being introduced then dying, we actually care about him as a character because we knew him so much more than we ever had before. I think doing that was a great bit of writing and Peter only really completely becomes Spidey after he defeats the Green Goblin for the first time and that's when his transformation into Spider-Man is complete in my opinion. There's some really cool art in this and I remember when I first read the comic my initial reaction was that I just couldn't make up my mind about it. Bagley has this very loosey goosey style that I don't recall seeing in his 90s Spider-Man stuff but it's just so apparent here. But as I kept reading it grew on me and I realised it just wasn't a traditional boxy comic art style for the most part, it was just a bit looser and this let Bagley draw some really emotional and expressive stuff. Norman Osborn's face is definitely still boxy, J. Jonah Jameson's is as well but everyone else is drawn a lot more fluid, freestyle, I'm not quite sure what to call it and some of the scenes look incredible like when we see the Green Goblin for the first time or when Spidey does his web slinging, it looks really cool and pops out of the page. So with 40 issues in this Omni, it covers quite a few arcs. The first is the spider bite and the first round with the Green Goblin, and the second is Peter grieving for Uncle Ben, getting a job, trying to deal with the new dynamic with Aunt May, and tracking down Uncle Ben's killer in terms of how he fits in street organisations, and this leads him to the Kingpin. One of my favourite moments in the entire Spidey universe comes from the first arc and that's when Peter is reacting to his spider bite and spazzes out at his desk and Kong goes and now for my next trick I shall trip up while actually sitting down. <laughs> there are so many good moments throughout the whole series but that one gets me every time. I thought it was an interesting arc because it leads him straight to J. Jonah Jameson as well as introducing Ultimate Electro and you can really see how between Electro and Spider-Man, The Amazing Spider-Man 2 really based its character design off of this comic. You can even see it in the Osborns because if I remember correctly they had a disease that mutated them into the goblins and that's sort of what happens in Ultimate Spider-Man. It's just a shame the Amazing Spidey movies were so average, especially when you compare them to the Raimi trilogy, which also borrowed or shared so much with Ultimate Spider-Man. I also liked how Peter's school life tied into the Kingpin story, with him learning about Watergate at school and applying it to his encounters with Wilson Fisk. I thought that was a really good bit of writing. I also loved Mary Jane's reaction when Peter told her who he is and the way Peter has to convince her. The third arc is one I remember vividly from when I was a teenager, the Doctor Octopus arc. Man, this arc just blew up. One minute Peter's in New York, the next he's stuck to the side of a lorry going down the New Jersey Turnpike and he gets stuck in traffic, which I thought was particularly funny because the traffic there is fucking awful and when I was a teenager I had a flight back to England and I missed it because of the traffic on the New Jersey Turnpike, so I really do get the joke there. Dr. Octopus's eyes looked amazing when they got damaged in the Oz experiment at the beginning of the book and I quite like his costume design. This arc also has Kong's realisation that Peter is Spider-Man as well as the introduction of Gwen Stacy who I absolutely love. She's so fucking kick-ass in this man, she's, she's balls to the wall. Craven also gets introduced and it's quite funny how lame he is but it plays into something that happens later on in the comics and ties in with the Ultimates comics as well. There's also a story where Hammer Industries plays a part in everything that's happened so far except the creation of Spider-Man and it all comes to a head with Doc Ock going mental and fighting Spider-Man at night on TV. I love how his arms look in this, I love the way they sometimes have claws on them and sometimes they don't like they fold in or something. 
The next arc is the return of both Harry and Norman Osborn, and I think it's the last we see of them, Norman at least, until Ultimate Six, which is the ultimate version of the Sinister Six, and that story was absolutely awesome. It had a different art style, but I really liked it. The Return of the Osborns arc does a really good job of showing just how controlling and insane Norman Osborn really is and does a fantastic job of showing why Peter doesn't tell people his secret. Norman Osborn knows who Peter is and just look at the havoc he's wreaking both kidnapping Mary Jane but also playing mind games with Peter about Aunt May. He really is a piece of work in this, and that's a testament to both the writing and the art in this book. There's this whole side story with Nick Fury, who now looks like Samuel Jackson despite him looking nothing like him in Ultimate X-Men, which is actually why Sam Jackson plays him in the movies now. Nick Fury tries to guide Peter, but eventually warns him that when he turns 18, he'll legally belong to the government, and by extension Nick Fury, and that freaks Peter out. I want to say, sadly, he never made it to that age, but if he had, he would have eventually joined the Ultimates, which is this universe's Avengers, but there are also Avengers later on in the Death of Spider-Man story, but these are the ones that are like Captain America, Iron Man, that sort of thing. The problem with that is I can't actually say he didn't make it to 18. But we'll talk about that in a couple of years when I eventually get to that arc. The next arc is about someone else dressing up as Spider-Man and Robin Banks and Peter has to stop him. You would think it's the chameleon, but it actually isn't. I don't know why Bendis wrote it like that, but I remember feeling a bit deflated at the reveal, like I'd been led on to believe something only to have it taken away. It felt like I'd just watched The Last Jedi to be honest, but not that bad. But this arc leads up to a bank robbery by this guy, and the concluding moment is when Captain Stacy dies by protecting people from an explosion, leaving Gwen hateful towards Spider-Man in the same way Harry was towards him in the Raimi movies. So much was either borrowed from these books or created together with the movies and shared freely, and they're still the best Spider-Man movies in my opinion, and it's because it comes from a really good strong foundation. The last arc is the Venom arc, and for the first time we get to see images of Peter's parents as he watches an old videotape of them at a picnic when Peter was a kid, and this in turn leads up to us being introduced to Eddie Brock, who looks like a total fucking loser in this. This of course leads up to the black suit, which rather than being an alien symbiote, is actually a cure for cancer that Peter and Eddie's parents worked on together, and again, that's a great bit of writing. It explains why the suit is a symbiote. It would have to interact with somebody's body on a very small and invasive, maybe even molecular level to cure cancer. Brilliant. I've never been keen on the way they keep redesigning Venom, or different artists draw him differently in the main Marvel universe, but since this is a separate universe, with everyone pretty much completely redesigned, I don't mind it since they made a design and stuck with it throughout the whole of the Ultimate Universe. Just like the normal universe, Peter joins with the black suit, realises its destructive capabilities, gets rid of it, only for it to join Eddie Brock. It's a good retelling of the original story. It's faithful to it, but new. This arc also has Ben Riley in it, which is ironic, since he plays a part in the creation of Carnage and starts the ball rolling for the Clone Saga much later on, but at this point he's just a janitor. I remember feeling underwhelmed when I realised that Bendis wasn't actually going to go anywhere with his character, and it's sad that he never did, although we did get another clone of Peter in the Clone Saga, but like I said, I won't spoil that for anyone who hasn't read that far yet. 
And then there's the Hearth issue, which to be honest I don't remember reading, but I gave it a very quick look and it reminds me of the free comic book day comics where it's a very basic story and since it's like an issue or an annual that makes sense. And that's it for the comics. It's a massive collection and it's very impressive. The back of the book contains a few extras including the Joe Quesada variant covers for issue 1 and 2. This cover is the one we had for issue 2 in England even though it's the variant for some reason. Don't understand that but whatever. And there's also some talk about exactly how and why the creation of the Ultimate Universe occurred at Marvel and I think there's some memos people sent each other about when they were still planning it which is pretty cool. There's also some good guy character concept art, six issues worth of story outlines, then there's some bad guy concept art, then Bagley's raw pencils that were for the covers. It's a good amount of extras, not too much, but there's enough there to just sit and read for a session or two. And that's the Ultimate Spider-Man Omnibus. I'm so pleased I got this. It cost me £70 including delivery. But that's incredibly cheap. These things sell for double that on eBay and this one had the dust jacket I wanted as well. I'm really looking forward to reading this and like I said when I do eventually get round to reviewing the Ultimate Marvel books when I do Spider-Man I'll be reading this. If anyone out there hasn't tried Ultimate Spider-Man or they're sitting on the fence about it I thoroughly recommend you at least try the first full run by Bendis and Bagley and you can call it a day there if you want. They broke their own golden rules about the Ultimate Universe way later in the comics and that absolutely ruined it for me but this era of the Ultimate Universe was absolutely golden and I really recommend you check it out. The Ultimate Spidey Omni is actually the biggest book I owned for about two days. I've never had a book that big. But then I had another delivery which was the um, Transformers premiere collections. I've got volumes one and two with the dust jackets and they're fucking gigantic. <laughs> so for all of two days it was the biggest book I had and then these Transformer books which are about an inch and a half taller than the Omnibus came along and stole its crown. <laughs> But yeah, you do get a lot in this, um, and if you can find it, it's definitely worth buying, even without the dust jacket, because it's just such a beautiful book. Even the boards, that silver and red, and it's such a good story. I really, really recommend Ultimate Spider-Man. <laughs>